Hey everyone, welcome to the FedNav seminar. We're very happy to have Yifan Wang, who's going to tell us about bootstrapping boundaries and frames. All right, thanks. Close to here. Okay, close to thanks. it's over there. Well, uh, thanks, thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks for your invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to visit and to give a talk about this uh, upcoming work uh, with uh, Scott Collier at Princeton and uh, Dalimil Mazak at uh, IES. And as you can see, this is about some ongoing work. And so part of uh, one purpose of this talk is to kind of solicit uh, feedbacks and comments from the uh, from the broad, broad audience here. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point. Um, so let, let us jump into the, the main part of the talk. So I'll introduce the main player today on the top. Uh, that are, uh, which are couple boundaries. Uh, to the CFTs. Okay. Uh, for this audience, I, I think it's probably not necessary to uh, to explain the importance of these objects in the in both in the broad uh, setting of uh, different branches of theoretical physics. Uh, let me just uh, give a few examples uh, to orient those who are not so familiar with this subject. Uh, so these conformal boundaries in 2D CFD, uh, they play an important role in Kamen's matter theory uh, as describing uh, critical impurities uh, in one dimensional quantum chain. One famous example is given by the Kondo effect. Uh, there have been many generalizations and more sophisticated examples of this uh, in other more, more, uh, more complicated uh, quantum chains. And these couple of boundaries also play an important role in string theory. Uh, they describe p brains uh, from the worship perspective uh, through boundary conditions of your worship CFT. Okay. And as we know, p brains are very important objects in string theory for the well-definedness of, of the string theory at a number of different level. And lastly, more, more recently, in the context of abs cfd correspondence, in particular, in the context of three-dimensional abs cfd correspondence, where the gravity theory lives in three dimensions, uh, this, uh, this couple of boundaries of the boundary CFT will correspond to so-called end of world brands. In the quantum gravity of the ABS3. And these annual world brains, uh, brains have played an important role uh, in understanding black hole evaporation uh, in recent years. Okay. Uh, so there are some questions. Given the main player, there's some immediate question one can ask uh, uh, about this, uh, uh, these objects. But uh, to, before that, let me let me let me let me just uh, give you an overview of the red under, understanding of these objects. Okay. So this is the subject study of this couple of boundaries in 2D CFD is a subject of long history. So uh, first of all, there are many examples, the explicit realization of this couple of boundaries in specific example of 2D CFDs. In particular, when the CFT is described by, by rational, so called rational form field theories. Where in, in those cases, if, the, if this couple boundaries preserve a large enough uh, so called car algebra, which is some symmetry that, are, uh, that contains Verisor algebra, in those cases, the boundary space can be solved explicitly. And this gives very concrete the realization of this couple boundaries in non trivial 2D CFTs. Another large uh, set of examples of this couple of boundaries, uh, which is useful in this context, correspond to a supersymmetric uh, or equivalently SPPS brains uh, in superstring theory. 
the D pranks, the D out pranks in type two, uh, type three string theory and the D even uh, 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 pranks in type two eight string theory. Uh, those are familiar examples of this boundary space from the uh, worksheet perspective. And lastly, uh, there's a nice, a nice set of uh, um, descriptions of this anti war brains in context of video three, just by uh, you, if I'm solving, looking at solutions of Einstein equation in the presence of a boundary that extends in, into the ADS3 block. And these are, given, uh, these are described by so called semi classical solution or semi classical end up world brains. Well, these developments are largely incomplete. Uh, so there's a natural question that one can ask. First of all, even in the realm of uh, uh, rational conformal field theories, one can ask if there's actually a classification, if there's in any sense a classification of the uh, boundary states, uh, of the conformal boundaries. Okay. The answer is yes, if the center chart is smaller than one. But for RCFPs with uh, center charts bigger than one, there's no known classification of these boundaries if the boundary do not preserve the full uh, car algebra. Similarly, in the second case, we know that uh, the supersymmetric or the PPS brain in string theory gave the class, nice class of these uh, uh, brains uh, uh, in, in string theory in the sense that they're there's a question. Is there like a moral justification? What have, what's what's so much harder for C greater than one? Uh, it's just because so for C smaller than one, the car algebra, uh, if it's a diagonal theory, the car algebra is just a Virasor algebra, and all the conformal boundaries always preserve Virasor algebra, and because the theory is uh, is rational with respect to the Virasor algebra, this is why you can classify them. So because they're the Virasoro primaries are in one to one corresponds to Ishibashi states, and you only have a finite number of Ishibashi states, and all the couple boundaries are built out of them, and that's a finite problem you can solve. But when C is bigger than one, you always have an even number of Virasoro primaries. So if you want to solve the most general couple boundaries that only preserve the uh, conformal symmetry, it's a much harder problem. There's a much larger, it's an infinite number of uh, uh, numbers you have to you have to tune. But if it's a rational theory and C is greater than one, then, there, then there's a chiral algebra that's bigger than Virasoro. That's right. So, so when I there's still a finite number of Ishibashi states with respect to the larger chiral algebra. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure if you understand your question. Uh, I'm not sure your question correctly. So, when I when I say when I speak of RCFT, I mean a CFT with a chiral algebra with respect to which the CFT has a finite number of couple blocks. So, the chiral algebra in that context can be maximal, or it could be an intermediate one, but such that the CFT has a finite number of blocks, such as the three state path is uh, RCFT with respect to the W3, but they can also be thought of as RCFT with respect to Verisoro in my definition here. Right, but what's the problem with constructing uh, Cardi states in such a theory? So, if, if uh, so, in that case, it's not a problem because the three state path has center charge that's smaller than one. But if center charge is bigger than one, uh, if I want to consider most general couple of boundaries, meaning that they are built out of Ishibashi state just for the Verisoro, I have an even, even number of numbers I, I need to tune. Okay, but if you, but all right. Jeff, a subset of the boundary states will be, will, will uh, respect the maximal chiral algebra, but there are more boundary states that's than right, just those. Right. So that's right. So the, so of course you can always construct. So you're completely right for a center bigger than one. If the theory is rational, there's a nice a set of subset of the couple of boundary you can, you can construct. Those are precisely the ones that preserve the, the car algebra that makes the theory rational. But here I'm asking the general question, when I speak of classification, I'm talking about classification of the most general couple of boundaries in those theories. Subject to what conditions? Uh, I'll, I'll explain. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry, this is just the uh, kind of the introduction. So I'm not giving you all the details, but all the details will come back. If not, please interrupt. Okay, thanks all for, for all the very nice question. Uh, so the other uh, question I want to raise here in this context is that uh, so these these uh, PPS brains give very nice examples of what's known as stable D brains in string theory, 
but you can ask if they're stable non BPS breaks. Okay. Uh, this is much less well known, but there are some examples from the works from Sen, Gabardil, and Bergman. And but there's no kind of a general exploration. Okay. And uh, the one thing I'm trying to advocate here is this uh, framework, uh, this uh, program that we are pursuing here will pre provide kind of a stepping stone to attack this question. But I will not solve this question in this talk. I'll, I'll solve some related question in this talk. In the boundary CFT formulation, stable means without. Addition. I'll explain. Yes. Uh, so here, when I when I talk about stable, I'm talking about just perturbative stability, and that means the boundary CFT does not have a random operator um, that will trigger attack, uh, you know, attack and condensation. And in the supersymmetric case, because you want the boundary state to also preserve this Roche supersymmetry, the diagonal part, so you want the uh, the brain to, to, to not have a supersymmetric primary uh, whose uh, supersymmetric descent will be relevant. So that you need to, uh, in that case, you need to exclude operators that make a half or smaller. Okay. And those in the string theory language correspond to open string packets. And lastly, uh, whenever you have this kind of uh, classical picture of like semi-classical picture of quantum gravity, you want to ask if there are actually cons uh, consistency constraints coming from the quantum gravity completion. So in this case, one can ask uh, if this naive semi-classical solutions are actually consistent with notion of pure ADS3 gravity. They're coming from uh, some generalization of the modular invariance in the case in the presence of boundaries, which we will talk about. Isn't pure ADS3 gravity already essentially ruled out? Sorry? Isn't pure ADS3 gravity already known essentially to be? That's right. So, so the point is that the, the kind of uh, the motivation we take here is that you are right for the, your pure ADS3 gravity. You assume that pure ADS3 gravity, uh, the brain function is can be generated as the Molyneux Witten type by doing SL2D sum over the vacuum block, then it's ruled out because of possible uh, negativity. Okay. So that's one way to see it. But as we'll see here, we'll, I'll provide an independent argument for why the pure yes bridge of uh, gravity will be ruled out by consideration of boundaries. I don't think Maloney wouldn't lose out pure yes three gravity. It says that particular construction wasn't. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's still so, have so. some old doubts. That like exactly. Just, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the comment. Yes. So, in principle, I guess what uh, Nima was trying to say is that there may be a different way. To do an SL2D sum that cook up an SL2D invariant random function uh, that contains the semi collapsible solutions and their one book contributions, but it's not that the really type that has not been uh, shown. Okay. What is our goal here? Present a bunch of questions. Of course, the goal is to address these questions. And how do we address this question? We express this question by uh, exploring the landscape of boundaries uh, by the bootstrap method, which have been recently used uh, to study various other properties of two-dimensional series. Okay. Uh, for those of you, uh, I think this is probably a word that's familiar to both of you, but for <laughs> those of you who are not familiar with this word, uh, this just corresponds to uh, kind of uh, uh, exploring basic constraints. Bootstrap means uh, by studying basic, con basis, basic, basic consistency uh, conditions uh, by imposing basic conditions, basic consistent conditions of whole boundaries. Uh, which I'll I will review. But uh, if you want, one wants to kind of explore the landscape uh, of some theoretical objects, uh, we need to first introduce a, a set of coordinates on this uh, on this landscape. So the coordinates we'll, we'll be using 
uh, involve the, few, the following ingredients. So be, there will be the bulk center charge, the component center charge, that essentially characterize the number of degrees freedom in your theory. Uh, there will be a gap, delta gap, uh, which, uh, which denotes the uh, Skinner gap in the bulk operator spectrum. Uh, there's also a boundary quantity, uh, which is uh, sometimes known as the the the, uh, the boundary tension or the brain tension, and it's related to the so-called boundary entropy. If you take the log, um, I will review those notions in more detail later. And uh, lastly, the last coordinate is the uh, the boundary gap, okay? uh, which is the gap in the boundary operator spectrum. Okay. Now that I've presented the goal, uh, let me just uh, summarize the main results. So the main results we have obtained so far are for uh, reducible boundaries of bosonic CFPs. The irreducible here just means that uh, you can, whenever you have a set of boundary states or set of couple of boundaries, you can take the integer linear combination, positive integer linear combination of them, and they give rise to other boundary states that will solve the basis and consistent conditions, which I'll review. Uh, but the results I'm presenting here are just are applicable to the ones that are irreducible. Okay? They cannot be decomposed further. Result number one will derive some universal. Upper bound uh, on the on the spring tension, which uh, just to uh, say again, uh, just like a Boltzner charge, which is a characterization of characterization of the number of degrees freedom in the ball, the brain tension is a is a count is a regularized count of the degrees freedom on the boundary, and uh, result number one we derive an upper bound on the brain tension. That only depends on the bulk center charge. Okay. For stable brains or stable topological boundaries. So in this talk, I'll use brain topological boundaries uh, interchangeably. And so this means that H gap is important. Okay. We derive such a universal bound. Uh, for any value of center charge that only depends on the center charge. Okay. And how you should interpret this bound, it tells you that, for example, uh, given a center charge, completely, you don't need to specify the CFP. It tells you that if your uh, boundary entropy for the given boundary condition has a G, the boundary tension is it's above this value, it has to be able to decay. Okay? It cannot be stable. It has to contain open string tachyon in the open string spectrum. And if you turn that on, that will trigger RT flow. To some uh, to some new uh, uh, to some some new couple boundary, and in the end, there'll be some some couple boundary value that's below this uh, upper bound. Okay, but I guess in principle, the relevant deformation could be forbidden by some global symmetry, right? That's right. Here we are completely oblivious to any global symmetry, but you are right. If we insist on uh, the flow of preserving some sy symmetry in your system. For example, supersymmetry. Right. That's how the supersymmetric one works. That's right. That's right. Exactly. 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 Did you do a wave current, or did you keep? Could it be like a Z two symmetry. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, it can be any discrete symmetry. Yes. I just talking about in your bootstrap setup. Did you allow for current? Yeah, yeah. We don't make any assumption apart from what I've said. Okay. So the power of what I'm going to say here is that there are little assumptions, and there are going to be very strong results, and the matches is going to come from uh, positivity, which I'll review. And the second result uh, that will find unique solution to the bootstrap equation, so unique stable brains uh, in the sequence of RCFPs. Okay. 
the center charts say very particular that one. Okay. I'll describe them explicitly. So it turns out that in the sequence of RCFDs, uh, the 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 if you want the brain to be stable, this tension is going to be unique, and the boundary spectrum is uniquely fixed. And once again, emphasize that uh, the couple of boundaries I'm going to describe here uh, are not required to preserve anything that's larger than their sort of symmetry. And thirdly, we'll see that the semi classical end of war brains that people have discussed It's not going to be incompatible. It's going to, going to be incompatible with the strict notion of pure gravity. There's multiple ways, multiple ways you can interpret this result. This, so if you take this semi-classical brain as granted. This gives you another argument to saying that the strict motion of pure gravity in this three does not exist as a consistent theory. You can also interpret it differently if you insist on this notion of this pure gravity in ADS3, which you know there are some, some suggested counter argument, but no fully proof. It will put the constraint on what kind of uh, the semi classical solution can make sense at a quantum level. Uh, and finally, Uh, well, we'll also find refined, refined bounds. So, so far the bounds are kind of universal, uh, apart from uh, these two cases, but the, the bound presenting the first bullet point is uh, universal, but you can get refined bound once you, uh, once you put more, in, more information, like the spectrum in the block. For example, we'll find refined bound, lower bound on the, on the tension. Once we put the information about the block gap, okay. And also stronger upper bound if we put the information about the the, uh, uh, the boundary gap. And uh, as you may know, uh, the the bounds can come from two sources. It could be numerical. It could be analytical. And in case of analytic bounds, so I'll discuss both bounds. And in the case of analytic bounds, this gives mathematical rigorous proof uh, in specific RCFTs. For example, it tells you that in the EA level one and the monster squared CFT, where some rational brains are known. Okay, so in this case, uh, the rational brain, just the identity brain in the theory. I'll reveal that. In this case, it's again just the identity brain up to some group action associated with the discrete symmetry. Uh, but it will prove a general, argue, a general result that says that in these theories, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, this uh, brain tension is bounded below precisely by one. And it's saturated by the known theories. Okay, so this is a mathematically rigorous uh, result. Coming from another bounds, which I'll explain. So, uh, could you remind me? It went by a little fast for me. What What's the definition of irreducible? Ah, so so uh, I'll I'll review it uh, later as well. But uh, for irreducible, irreducible uh, practically it means that if you look in the open string channel, there's a unique identity operator come from come with your degeneracy one. So no, no chan patent factors, in other words. That's right, that's right, that's right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so what is the setup uh, for this analysis? Okay. So to be specific, uh, so the bulk CFT is, is assumed to be unitary, compact, to the CFT. The center charge C and a discrete uh, set of operator spectrum labeled by dimension and J. Okay. Uh, parameterize your Hubert space on S1. There's a nice, uh, because the theory is large invariance, 
there are two different ways to look at the couple of boundaries. So you can have the couple of boundaries, say on the hot space, okay, so a boundary. The couple of boundaries are characterized by uh, a cooling condition for your stress sensor. So say this is your complex Z coordinates for your space time. And the boundary is at uh, the imagined part of Z equal to zero. The control boundaries are defined by the cooling condition for the stress sensor that says the holomorphic and the holomorphic stress sensor agree restricted to the to the to the locus of the boundary. Okay. All right, conformal transformation. Uh, this is equivalent to a state in the radial quantization on the circle in this picture. And because it is a state on circle, it can be expanded uh, into uh, states in this Hilbert space. Okay. And there's, is it really formally in that Hilbert space? Yeah. Very nice question. Uh, mathematically, it's going to leave in some kind of a completion of the super space because the, 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 the state is not normalizable by itself. So, in particular, in a technical level, the state is going to be built from the Ishibashi state, which I'm going to explain. They don't live in, they don't really live in the Hilbert space because they're not normalizable. But I think there's kind of a regular, I mean, there's some kind of closure. I mean, I should, I, I should just say that I do not know the precise mathematical framework that, uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, as a physicist, this is something we can deal with in the sense that when we, we can compute the why natural regularization is to come from computing. Uh, we cannot, the, the inner product of this with itself is not normalized, it's not normalizable, but we can regularize this by uh, considering a, you know, a cylinder with a finite length, and that uh, the, the, the distance will provide, uh, provide this regularization parameter for this inner product. So in the, in the physics part of this talk, this is not going to make a difference. All right. So because, uh, this is going to be expandable in terms of states in this super space. Uh, you can find out a nice spaces to expand it in. And this, this nice spaces are given by the so-called Ishibashi state. So I use this P alpha to denote the boundary and this notation to denote the boundary state equivalently. And it can be expanded into Ishibashi state, which are one-to-one uh, -one one -one correspondence with the scalar operators with respect to the Virasoro algebra in your operator spectrum. Uh, so these are the Ishibashi states. So just to come back to uh, Jeff's question before. So here I'm really considering the most general boundary conditions, which can be expanded, which can always be extended into Ishibashi state, states. And in cases where the boundary states preserve a higher Kyle algebra, this expansion can be reorganized into expansion of finite number of blocks, in which case the each of the block corresponds to Ishibashi state for the bigger Kyle algebra. Okay. So here, it's just Ishibashi for the Virasoro. That sum is over Virasoro primary scalars? Yeah, yeah. Uh, should say primary, okay. Good, thanks for the question. And the reason I give you uh, this Ishibashi they give you a nice basis is because this, uh, this set of states already satisfy the gluing condition. So uh, the further constraints, further constraints will be coming from the consistency of the CFP will, will, will be constraints on, just on these coefficients. And here I should note that there's an important term in the expansion uh, that is the coefficients that's multiplying the Ishibashi state correspond to the uh, identity. And that coefficient is the, the precisely the tension of the boundary, the tension of the brain. Uh, which, which provides one of the one, one of the coordinates uh, for this uh, landscape that we're trying to uh, we're trying to carve out here. Okay. I can still use some space on this board. Is it clear that g must be non-zero? Is it clear that g must be non-zero? Uh, let's see. Uh, 
In principle, no. In principle, no. At this stage, uh, but from additional constraints, uh, right? But from from all the other constraints, it turns out that they will have the have to be non-zero. So I don't know if I, I cannot give you a, a. There's no simple argument from unitarity or anything like that. that says the G has to be positive. Or okay, so so. Yeah, you, 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 you will see. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, there will be some argument. There, there is some argument like that, but it will depend on some efficient ingredient that I introduced. Yes. When you look at the finite function with the two boxes. Okay. So, in other words, if you want open string spectrum to be non trivial, then this, this tension better be non trivial. Okay. So, what I was trying to, uh, what I want to say here is just that. Uh, the task of trying to uh, constrain uh, this boundary space using basic consistent condition of the 2 BCFD within the parallel boundary is just to study uh, constraints on this guy, which is equivalent to the one point function of the bulk scalar operator in the presence of this component. Okay. There are two important constraints. One is known as the Cardi condition. Uh, which which start by looking at the cylinder with one boundary condition on the top and the other boundary condition on the bottom. Okay, and you think about this cylinder as the closed string propagation diagram uh, in this direction as time, where the propagation is dictated by the closed string Hamiltonian. Now you can equivalently build this uh, picture the sideways. And this becomes uh, it becomes the 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 thermal boundary function for the open string spectrum, where the propagation uh, given in this time direction is dictated by the open string Hamiltonian. Okay. And by consistency, uh, these two different ways to interpret this uh, block uh, better give the same result. And as you will see, this will give to give rise to strong constraints on these coefficients. And just for completeness, uh, which I will not use in the talk. But let, let me also write down the other consistency condition coming from the consistency of the 2DCFD in the presence of boundary. That is sometimes known as the uh, ceiling condition or the boundary, bo boundary bo bootstrap equation. In that case, uh, you consider a single boundary. The alpha and with two local operators. And you study the observable that involves this two point function of the sky in the presence of a couple boundary. So, one nice thing about CFD, you can do OPE expansion. And in this case, there are two ways to do the OPE limit, to take the OPE limit. One way is to consider the OPE limit in the bulk, in which case you fuse into some local operator and you should sum over the possible local operator that can propagate here. And there's some one-point function with this bound. There's a different OPE limit. Where instead, you fuse the operators with the boundary. And there will be some open string, uh, there will be some uh, operators in the boundary operator spectrum that propagate on the boundary. Okay. I feel by side K. And again, you are summing over them. And by consistency of the uh, associativity <coughs> of the operator algebra in the of boundary, this must uh, again produce the same answer. And this gives rise to some further constraint on these coefficients. And it's known that there are simple answers to this Cartesian condition that fails when you impose these conditions. So these conditions are non trivial. But uh, as we'll see in this talk, for example, that we look at, this is already strong enough to produce very non trivial bounds. And in some cases, uh, pin down the, the, uh, the boundary uh, operator data uniquely. Okay. But in that, principle, you want to study these constraints as well. Okay. Can that uh, second uh, thing that you mentioned that the bulk boundary bootstrap fails even though the party condition holds happen for rational party states? Uh, yes. So there are very, very nice examples in the paper from Terry Gannon. So the second condition uh, is related to so-called the name wrap condition. Uh, okay. 
uh, should I get into that? But okay, but what I'm saying, is there, there are examples where, uh, you know, the modular invariance, or the essentially the, the, you know, the, yeah, essentially, you know, the modular invariance, so you know, you know, you know, the cardio condition holds. Okay. But, uh, but this condition fails. But even if I'm RCFT, even in RCFTs where I'm imposing the cardi, the state, the, the state is a boundary state for the full chiral algebra. That's right. That's right. So there are some examples already in SU3 uh, models. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know this before. I learned this when I when I was writing some papers uh, in the course of this project. So, so, so that the point of this paper from Gannon, uh, yeah, uh, from T. Gannon, uh, is precisely to say that uh, yeah, this this is a uh, uh, this is a very good way to kind of understand. I mean, this is a very important ingredient to understand this. Uh, so even for RCFTs, it's far false to say that there are boundary states and one to one correspondence for primaries. This is this. These are all non-diagonal type. Oh, is it? But for a hundred examples are non non diagonal For diagonal, is it for diagonal, diagonal? it's trivial. Yeah. For diagonal, the, yeah, yeah, okay, very good. For diagonal part, diagonal uh, case, the Cartan condition implies the boundary implies this equation. This equation turns out to be equivalent to the Valente algebra. Sorry, it's not obvious, but it's kind of and if I'm in a non-rational theory, does the does the Cardi condition imply the bulk boundary if it's not? No. Okay. So for rational theory, let me just repeat. Okay, yeah, because I there are many words. If it's rational and diagonal with respect to the Cartan algebra, then this condition for the rational rings in that context implies this condition. Okay, more than in that because in that case this equation is just equivalent to the Lambda algebra in terms of conventional, uh, which is satisfied by the S matrix, which determine the multi invariance. Okay. Uh, but in the non-diagonal rational CFP, this condition does not imply this. In this case, the this equation is equivalent to so-called classifying algebra equation. It's something that gen generalizes the Lambda algebra, uh, but it's yeah, it's some more general notion which I don't want to get into here. Mm -hmm. And that's some uh, to give you some additional complications. Okay. And generally, can't I get the non-diagonal theories from the diagonal ones by doing an orbital fold? So very good question. So you can get them if you consider the more general. So you cannot always get them from from the diagonal one by gauging uh, invertible symmetry. But if you allow you to yourself to consider gauging this so-called algebra symmetric for Venus algebra objects in your modular tensor category, they can you can get from the diagonal one to the non-diagonal one. So for example, you don't get from but somehow this other this other identity can't be orbital fold. Yeah, so that's a very good the point, which I don't understand precisely why. Yeah, so as you said, uh, there should be a way to kind of understand. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't kind know. of anomaly or something. I mean, it sounds like you're trying to gauge a symmetry. You would have thought you could gauge it and get a consistent theory, but it sounds like there's an anomaly if it's. No, so so it, the point is the following, right? So you, when you try to gauge a symmetry, uh, there are a set of boundary states which are obvious, which are the ones that are kind of taken to be gauge invariant combinations. Those ones will de define you legit uh, boundary states in the gauge theory. Will satisfy all these constraints, both this and this. But those states are not going to be the complete set of boundaries in the orbital theory. You always, you always have to include these twisted sectors. And my understanding is that once you include those, uh, the constraint coming from here is stronger than just, the, just these conditions. Seems to be the so-called classifying algebra. Some old works of past year and... Uh, more stringent, then there must be cases where this identity is not satisfied after doing the orbital fold. Uh, 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 so, it's not uh, so, 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 so what, what I'm trying to say is that when you do orbital fold, there are two set of boundaries that you need to take, take care of. I, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying for the second, for the additional boundaries coming from the two sector, they will satisfy, they will be subject to this uh, more non trivial constraints. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm really addressing your question. Maybe I'm not completely understanding what your question is. Where we go on? I'll, ask, I'll try to ask maybe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, in any case, uh, it's, it will be very interesting to understand uh, whether this uh, positive algebra can be understood. Uh, 
by by this uh, gauging map. Okay, when you gauge this uh, some non invariable algebra algebra object. Okay. And I should say that the general expectation, uh, which is another proof, uh, but it can be made precise in the context of RCFDs that focus on boundaries that preserve the car algebra that makes the CFD RCFD, is that this set of conditions are the necessary and sufficient conditions to satisfy all the consistent conditions of a 2D CFD with the boundary. It means that if you consider arbitrary observable in a 2D CFD, this bulk operators and on the boundary, uh, and you want the observer to be consistent with cutting and gluing the underlying rim surface, these are the sufficient and necessary set of consistent conditions. So this is not proof for a general, uh, like a irrational CFD, but we'll take this as uh, uh, some expected, uh, um, this is the expected case. But okay, but the, the, because in this talk, I'll just focus on constraints coming from one of these full stride equations. Um, I will not rely on this expectation. Uh, but I, I bring this up just because this kind of uh, uh, kind of contrary to what we expect in higher dimensions. So here I said that uh, there's sort of essentially from these equations, uh, the, the, the bulk operator spectrum essentially fixes the boundary operator spectrum uh, completely. It fixes the set of boundaries you can have in the CFD, also fix what kind of operators are miscible on the boundary. And this is very different in higher dimensions where you can have CFDs with the same local operator spectrum but completely different set of uh, defects. Okay. Uh, just uh, point it out just for to, to highlight this uh, difference. So here uh, will be kind of more uh, pragmatic. Instead of studying for the full set of constraints, we'll study constraints on this uh, uh, this block. One point function in the present boundary, or in other words, this, this boundary coefficients when you expand it in terms of the Shivashi states from the simplest uh, from the simplest condition, namely uh, just the Cartier condition with identical boundaries. Uh, and this is a notation for the boundary. And it turns out that we'll find very strong constraints just from this seemingly very simple uh, com uh, condition. And as you may, may know, if you follow the bootstrap literature, the magic is coming from positivity, from unitarity. In other words, So this very simple equation combined with the entirety will turn out to provide very strong constraints. So uh, what is the precise equation that we're, we're bootstrap equation that we'll study? So all this bootstrap uh, program start with a, a particular equation and in particular, a very simple equation. The bootstrap equation here involves uh, just the, this diagram uh, kind of unpacked on both sides with the identical boundary on two ends. On one side, uh, you have the uh, cold stream propagation uh, with the modular parameter T, which tries the length of the cylinder. And on the right hand side, you have the thermal Hunting function in the open string Hilbert space. Okay, I use this to you know open string Hilbert space with the boundaries. And with the inverse uh, moduli. Uh, and uh, the propagation is given by the open string Hamiltonian. And this, for that reason, this is also known as the open string duality in the 2 d And if you define uh, analogous to a uh, usual modular bootstrap, you define the QQ total parameter related by uh, S duality, so 2 z S duality uh, in terms of this moduli T as follows. Then this equation can be expanded in terms of, uh, because this boundary space preserves the Rossorian symmetry, 
both sides of the equation can be expanded in terms of Verisoro blocks here are given by the Verisoro characters. And what you have is that on the right hand side, on the left hand side, uh, you have this expression. Okay. The propagation can be decomposed into propagations of individual scalars. Okay. So I here is summing over box scalars where total dimension is delta I. So half is the homomorphic dimension. And on the right hand side, uh, you just have uh, sum over in the degeneracies, some over the uh, open string uh, uh, spectrum uh, with degeneracies labeled by these integers, positive integers. Okay. And this is the key equation that we'll be studying. And just to, uh, one thing to notice about this equation is it has nice positive, positivity property in the sense that the coefficient when you expand into various other characters on both uh, the closed string side and the open string side come with positive coefficients. Of course, something more, something that's also very important is that this coefficient is uh, discrete, but we'll not explore constraint coming from discrete in this talk. Okay, that will be something uh, also to be interesting to be explored in the future. Here, I'll just explore uh, the positivity of this equation. How am I doing with time? I was started a bit late, so. I have 50 minutes? Or more, yeah. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me try to be brief. Uh, some very nice questions. Okay, so there are a few comments. Uh, I think some of the comments are already made, so let me just uh, be brief here. So uh, if you stare at it, stare at it uh, this is a very complicated equation. So this is because in general CFPs, this sum is going to be infinite. Uh, this sum is going to be infinite, unlike in rational theories when you consider rational boundary conditions that preserve the bigger car algebra where you have finite number of blocks. In general, you have infinite number of subject characters. So this is like you have infinite sum on both sides. And also you have a one parameter family of solutions parameterized by this module like T. Okay? So this is the first point. Okay? And this is reminiscent of the modular bootstrap equation, but the difference from that case is that you have the same object showing on the left and the right side. Okay. It's a generously expanded in terms of the Verisoro characters. And another thing that I already mentioned is that even though these equations are very complicated, in magical situations where, uh, where the boundary space preserve the higher car algebra, both sides of the equation can be reorganized into a finite sum, where the individual block in that case are the character associated with the higher algebra. And in those cases, the equation reduced to some kind of a finite sum of both sides, and those equations can be solved exactly. And this gives rise to solution, exact solutions in RCFPs. Okay? And in the case when the RCFP is described by a diagonal uh, um, algebra invariant with respect to the car algebra, the boundary states are one to one correspondence. Let me just write out something instead of just words. In this case, the rational boundaries in the boundary that preserve the uh, the car algebra are going to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the car primaries with respect to the, the algebra. Okay. And more generally, if you're not talking about some uh, diagonal RCFT, uh, this boundary stays. So this is diagonal. More general. Uh, this boundary states will be one to one correspondence uh, with the objects in the modular in the modular tensor category of the underlying modular tensor category that defines R C. If you don't know, know this, what what this word means, it's not so important. It's just for the next word. So in this case, the modular tensor category is identified with the representation category associated with the parallel. Next. There's a very nice way to generate more solutions if you know some solution in your RCFT. Uh, by consideration of topological lines, uh, in the case of rational CFTs with diagonal module invariants, these topological lines are generalizations of the usual Valinde line defect. Okay? And if you have uh, such line defect, okay, you can consider a fusion of this line defect with a given boundary state. That solve this consistent condition together with the others, 
possibly. And this will give you automatically a boundary state that is that satisfy all the consistent conditions. This is thanks to the rigid structure that is satisfied with logical life effects, which uh, I don't have time to review here. So this gave rise to a kind of a solution generating uh, machinery. Uh, start from, starting from one solution to the post right equations, other solutions that satisfy the post right equation. All right. And there's some more generic uh, comment you can make about this modular bootstrap equation. Uh, Are solutions to this equation isolated or do they come in continuous families? Uh, very good question. Um, when your when your uh, when your theory when your boundary sorry when your boundary states come with a marginal parameter, there will be continuous family of solutions. But in some cases, it will be isolated. It will depend on the precise case. But if you so if you if you have like a sorry sorry cat so movie and you just look at your sorrow, can't you always could you always rotate the yeah so sorry I, I made the wrong statement. So when your bulk theory has uh, marginal parameters. In that case, there's there can be a family of uh, boundary states that depend on the marginal parameter, and the spectrum close to the spectrum end, the boundary spectrum end is G would depend on uh, this marginal parameter. So that's a continuous family to this uh, equation. But if it's just a marginal parameter on the boundary, in that case, the G is independent as a consequence of G theorem that I was just going to review, and that implies from this equation that the boundary spectrum also doesn't. Well, the boundary spectrum can change or cannot, or it does not change. Okay. Case. There's some, there's something kind of quantized on the right hand side, right? There's these integers. That's, that's right. right. That's right. So they're not moving in the families. Uh, but uh, you know, you can have so different H, H's are moving, but the integers are not moving. No, but the, this this numbers this numbers can change. So different different. I mean, not integers from different H can combine. And, uh, you see what I mean? Basically, the H is moving. Yeah, the H's are moving, so the different integers can combine. So you can already find a case like this in the C21 overflow theory. So you are right that if you have a WCL model, you consider a boundary in that case, and you consider a group rotation on the boundary, it will not change this end. Okay. And that, that's clear from the left hand side, essentially, because the B square does not depend on the unitary transformation on the boundary. But the more kind of the more general, more generally, this is not the case for general marginal parameters. All right. Uh, the, the, there are several significant, uh, significant physical significance of this uh, this uh, ring tension I want to highlight. Uh, first of all. Uh, this uh, ring tension determines the high temperature behavior of the open stream learning function. Okay. For example, uh, if you consider the limit where this moduli goes to infinity in the in the closed stream channel. Well, corresponding to the open stream channel, uh, this will grow like uh, this. There's exponential growth, and the G function is what determines the overall coefficient of this exponential growth. Okay. And, and uh, just to uh, kind of uh, uh, repeat this point again, this G is uh, not to be monotonic on the boundary RB. <clears throat> Uh, which are which means this the deformation of the boundary states by uh, uh, by the terms of this form. Okay. So this is uh, on the boundary uh, where this is. Uh, so let me write psi. This is some operator in the boundary boundary operator spectrum and that has scaling dimension uh, smaller than one. Okay, no triggers on no trivial RG. And I, I will not uh, explain this, but uh, it turns out it's stronger in this case. The this uh, RG flow is 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 proven to be a uh, gradient. Okay. This is one of the few examples where we can actually prove this very strong statement about RG flows in quantum field theory. 
Is this proven by thinking of log g as some sort of boundary entropy? And That's right. Yeah, I didn't have time to get, get to that, but uh, precisely there's a notion of relating log g to the boundary entropy. And the boundary entropy provides you this gradient, I mean, this potential right. that it defines this gradient. Flow. Thanks for the question. But the, there are these nice properties that people have understood. But what is not understood is whether there are some bounds on g. Um, upper and lower bounds. Okay, there are some weak. At this stage, I should point out there are some weak lower bound uh, uh, by uh, by Friedan, uh, Konichny, and uh, Schmidt, calling it by himself, assuming. Uh, block gap that's above uh, c minus one over ten to the Okay, but uh, that is it. So if there's some very weak bound in that with that assumption, I think it's most more like a proof of principle. This is before people kind of uh, reinvented this uh, bootstrap uh, using this SDPP and so on. So it's kind of a primitive uh, uh, attempt. And what what we're what we're going to do here is like a more systematic approach to uh, to these bounds. Uh, by borrowing some of the more recent developments, both from a numerical side and from an analytical side. So, what is the strategy? So, just to be clear, a priori, there's no bound on uh, lower bound on g, like greater than zero, even or no. There's a there's a lower bound on the greater than zero, but there's no bound saying it has to be. Uh, where does it come? Where does it come from that it has to be greater than zero? So, uh, so if you are so okay, so they, so this comes from this equation. So this this uh, the G determines this this piece. Uh, so why does that mean it has to be greater than zero? So if you are uh, okay, so the open string spectrum, if it has any operator, there is some subleading piece. Though. Sorry, but the subleading is sub subleading exponentially. No, I know, but I'm just trying to understand why that why the leading term has to be non-zero. Uh, let's see. Okay, I was what I was going to say is that you assume if you assume some party behavior in the high energy uh, spectrum of the string, then this will lead to this because that will imply this coefficient. Okay, but you're asking if I don't assume that. Um, well, I'm just like an analogy with C, like C greater than zero has a sort of trivial one line argument from unitarity. Right. The two point function of the stress tensor. Right. Is there an analogous thing with like the stress tensor in the presence of the boundary or something like that? No, not. No. What about the graviton one point function? Yeah, that sounds like stress tensor. Mass, the mass of the D brain. Uh, if you, in that uh, specific context, this is related to the mass of D brain, yes. But so, uh, positive mass is positive G. So that, that sounds but, like there's a one line unitarity argument just in the CFT. Yeah, also. yeah. But I don't know the, C, the CFT argument for it to be uh, strictly bigger than zero rather than just uh, greater or equal to zero. Well, okay. Right. Okay. We can discuss it uh, afterwards. Yeah. It's a good question. I think there's an answer, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not able to reproduce it right now. Okay? But I, I think it's, it shouldn't be too hard to derive such a, such a uh, statement. Uh, so what are the strategy to approach uh, star? Uh, they're just based on this functional method. Uh, the idea is to uh, look at, stare at this bootstrap equation, uh, which I wrote here, and I can uh, move the left, right hand side to the left hand side. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Uh, you can have some. Okay, let me just write down this equation and say a few things. Okay. Here I'm summing over the bulk spectrum. Near the boundary spectrum with the minus sign because I move it to the left hand side. Okay. 
So we start from this bootstrap equation. We want to derive some balance on this coefficient g. Right? And this functional method, how it works, is that you want to look for some functional. You treat this as your space, as your you know vectors that generate your function space, and you want want to look for functionals that have the following properties: uh, a functional that is uh, uh, positive on these guys, a negative on these guys, and you look for functional uh, and the functional. I mean, uh, you can look for functional of also of, of this type. Okay, and whenever you find a certain functional. Well, this condition is not necessary. So you just need to need these conditions. Okay. Once you find such a functional, you can uh, this implies that this whole thing will be uh, non-positive, and this is going to derive some constraint on G alpha. And uh, sorry, why did you say you don't need the vacuum condition? Uh, because I'm just so so I just I'm trying to bound this coefficient. I'm trying not trying to bound the gap. I see you're saying if you find that. So I'm saying that, that with negative. this, this tells you that this whole thing has to be uh, non positive. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. And that's going to uh, give you some bound of this in terms of the functional evaluated on these guys. Good. And, uh, but whether the bound is upper bound or lower bound, depending on how the functional acts on this one, if it's negative or positive. Okay. Uh, so I'll normalize such that. Uh, uh, depending on plus minus convention, uh, acting on the vacuum functional, oh, sorry, acting on the vacuum block is positive or negative. Okay? And this will give rise to some upper bound and lower bound on uh, this uh, g square by the modular minus functional. And by the upper bound by the plus functional. So, so then, uh, right, I mean, what are w plus and w minus? Right. So, so w, uh, so w's are functionals that have this property positive on these guys and negative on this positive on the closed string blocks characters and negative, uh, sorry, um, negative uh, semi definite on the open string uh, uh, characters. Okay. And uh, with those conditions satisfied, I call it a plus uh, functional. If it is if I can normalize it such that acting on the vacuum character is plus one, I can always normalize it. If I if it can be normal subject to this condition, if it can be normalized such that acting on the vacuum block is minus one, I call it minus type functional. Well, you don't have to do this. I just did this to kind of to write down this equation in a simple way. Otherwise, you see that uh, whenever you have sub, sub functional satisfy this condition, you either derive a lower bound on G from this from this part, uh, from this part being uh, acting out uh, functional to be uh, you know, non-positive. You either get an upper bound on G if this is uh, positive, or you get a lower bound on G if this is negative. I'm just writing this down to kind of write down this very short expression. Hopefully that, that was that explains it. Uh, and then uh, and then once you kind of formulate the problem this way, uh, the, the the task to kind of find, find a stronger bound on this uh, g function just corresponds to optim optim optimization problem. Uh, try to explore in these functionals. And let me not explain it uh, right now more formulas, but there are two ways to approach. Uh, one way to approach it is to uh, use numerics to to come with some uh, vector space of uh, candidate functionals and you look for functional that satisfy these properties and they will give rise to these bounds and by exploring the space of such functionals you can get stronger and stronger bounds there's also a more ingenious approach which is to come with not functionals that are in this obviously in this vector space but those are kind of constructed analytically with some motivations elsewhere and uh, sometimes this can give uh, stronger bounds okay? uh, and this is uh, the only and this, I should say, the analytic functionals are very powerful, but they're kind of rare. And the only example that we know so far is the functional that uh, uh, that first applied in the context of one-dimensional four-point uh, bootstrap, and that, that has been related to the uh, two-point. Sorry, having related to the two-dimensional modular bootstrap, uh, to the functional that applies to the two-dimensional modular bootstrap by the pillow map. Okay, uh, I think I'm really out of time. So. Uh, fortunately, uh, is this the same functional Galamil term for the C equals 12 and C plus 4? Uh, 
The same uh, functional you can rewrite to apply to these kinds of characters. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, I think you meant uh, C2 8 and C2 oh, yeah. 4 C and C2 12. C uh, they're not the same. Not they the are same. the same functionals that apply in the case of square packets. Uh, so for the, okay, so I think this is kind of out of the logic. But uh, so uh, if you, if, for people who are familiar with the recent development relating uh, sphere packing to modular bootstrap, in that case, the, the relation is not status, per, perfect satisfactory because modular variance means nothing in sphere packing. No, it doesn't mean anything. In sphere packing, you have, you, you have a pattern function, which is written sum over essentially how you can kind of, uh, uh, um, kind of you can stack your, your spheres. Um, but uh, after, and after you do this modular transformation, you get another sum over a different lattice. It's a different lattice. I mean, so so there's no constraint from modular invariance, but there's a positivity constraints on, on the two sides, and that is more reminiscent of uh, the annulus bootstrap problem, where you have a two different spectrum on the two sides. So there you have two different lattices, and here you have different spectrums, and it turns out that the percent functional this w minus w plus that we encounter in the case of annulus bootstrap is precisely mathematically precisely the functional that I used for this uh, for the sphere packing. So it is the same function. It is the same function, okay. but uh, mathematically it's different from the from the one used for modular bootstrap. Yes, I'm so essentially there are two functionals. One acts on the symmetric part. So so this is getting the technical details. But there's one function that acts on the symmetric part when you subtract the character with is S transform. There's an anti-symmetric one. Only one of those plays a role in the case of uh, modular bootstrap, but both of them play a role in the case of sphere packing and also here. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I'm really running out of time. So let me just wrap up uh, by, right, I think I'm pretty running out of time. So let me just wrap up by making a few uh, statements, the theorems that we apply using this uh, proof, using the analytic uh, functional. Uh, so theorem number one. Uh, in the E8 level one CFD, uh, any conformal brain that preserves you know, various order symmetry uh, has a uh, brain tension that's bigger than one, okay? strictly bigger or, equal to, bigger or equal to one. And the boundary operator gap is also bounded above strictly by one. Okay? And G equal to one if on, and only if the gap in the boundary spectrum is one. And the boundary operator spectrum has a pending function that's precisely given by the J invariant uh, to the one third power. Okay. Theorem number two in the master squared SCFD, uh, a master squared CFD, G is again big or equal to one. And the boundary gap. It's bounded above by two. Okay? And again, you have this if and only if condition that says that g equal to one, and if and only, only if the boundary gap is two. And again, the operator spectrum on the boundary is precisely fixed uh, to be given by the g function with without the uh, so called current terms. And there are, uh, so these are very rigorous theorems, mathematically rigorous theorems based on a unique functional, but there are also theorems you can, you can produce, uh, prove similar flavors for, uh, for other RCFDs, so-called RCFDs that live in this beeline uh, exceptional series. Those are special because they have very relatively simple bulk operator spectrum, and we have two primary respect to the maximal pair algebra. In those cases, you can prove similar statement, but you cannot make this to be one numerically. It's going to be like 0.999 and so on. Uh, so these are the analytic functional are very useful in making this mathematically uh, rigorous and precise statements. Okay. Uh, let me also just say that in the, the numerical bound that we obtained, you can extrapolate to large C. And in those cases, you can find that there's contradiction to the existing semi-colical solutions of uh, adult world brains in ES3. Okay. In particular, we find that naively you can tune the tension arbitrarily within up to the, you know, the inverse size of ADS radius, but we find that there's upper bound on how, how much you can tune the tension. And as I said, you can interpret in two ways. One way is as a quick argument to against pure ADS3 gravity in the case of boundaries. Other way is to uh, 
to, to say that uh, this NL world brands themselves are incomplete. Okay. Uh, and there are many open questions, but I think I already mentioned some of them in the responding to some of the questions. So let me just end here and uh, thank you for attention. More questions for you? Um, yeah, I, I remember the paper by James Sully, where they basically tried to do sort of the equivalent of this uh, looking for a bulk point, sort of four point function mm -hmm. calculation, but in the boundary CFT. And what they were finding is that you sort of, uh, yeah, this, this end of world brain description uh, failed for, I think, too high of G, which is basically sort of the tension mm -hmm. of this end of world brain, and hence also sort of the angle that it makes relative to the, the boundary. And I think the sort of rationale there was that sort of things bounced off the wall too fast yeah. and there was some causality constraint I see. the boundary CFT. And I really wonder whether you could- I see, that's interesting. That, you know, that's interesting. Right. That you right. have as well. Yeah, so, so, so here are the constraints I explored. Because they're very different, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, I, I should look at our favorite. Yeah, 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 I can set that together. Yeah. 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 Thanks for the comment. I believe there are some contexts in like swampland. Exactly. World where Very good. people have, uh, have some belief that there should exist some stable non yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't get a time to talk about that. Uh, yes. We, used to... yeah, we, haven't, we haven't really explored that directly in, 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 this, uh, in this work. But indeed, that was one of the motivation for uh, starting this program. Uh, so there are some arguments in literature against uh, the existence of this, uh, stable non PPS brains. But uh, uh, Really, what? Yes, but the, I guess there. One side to the problem is the following. So uh, here, um, we tell we our bound tell you when the brain has to be unstable. Generalizing our bound to the case of this, for example, supersymmetric string theory. But uh, it doesn't pinpoint whether this uh, this this stable non BPS brain actually exists. So it tells you something, but it's not it's not so conclusive. It limits the possibility of, uh, put it another way, it limits the possibility of stable non PPS springs, but does not completely rule them out. I guess what, maybe what you have in mind is in specific cases, uh, this can be specific pushed. case you could just construct it explicitly. Uh, so, in some cases, like uh, which I didn't mention, uh, in special operators of type B string theory, there, uh, there's non PPS. No, in the, I think this work of Gabbardale and Berkman, consider type to be string theory on T4, and you consider overfold, uh, the Z2 overfold that reflects all the four directions and then additional fermionic symmetry. If you do that overfold, there are non PPS stable brains that, 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 uh, that uh, live in a theory. And that, maybe that's, this is what you meant. In that context, that would be a very interesting target to bootstrap to see if that's the only possibility or, yeah. Well, I think all of it sounds interesting. Yeah, both directions. Thank you. It's true that, like, so you compute bounds on G as a function of C. Is that, and yes. so in the, is it true that you found numerically that at those special values, again, you said like the numeric saturate the actual, is this the same thing that, because I guess in the modular story, that happened exactly at the E8 and the leech lattice. Yes, yes. This is the same thing is happening here. That's right. When you so try to optimize G. That's right. So there is a very good, yeah, there is a very nice story. So, so as you can tell, we did the analytic approach with the numerical approach. And it's very good thing to, re, I mean, to be kind of satisfactory. These two approaches, I mean, when the theory is saturated, the two approaches better agree. In particular, it should produce kind of similar or the same extremal functional because we explain this. We expect this kind of uh, saturating functional to be unique, and indeed, we find that to be almost identical. I mean, they're to your eye, they're really identical. If you plot the extremal functionals, analytic one and the one obtained from numerics, uh, up to you know 127 degrees dollars, solution per expert, uh, they look the same. Is there, is there features on the numerics? Is there like a king or anything at these places? Uh, I look at h as a function of c. Will I see some change of behavior? Uh, so not quite right. So so um, so I should say that in these cases where we find the numerics 
uh, it's saturated by these theories, when the bound is numerical bound is saturated by these theories, uh, we're just fixing a particular C, right? And we're putting information about the bulk. So for example, here, uh, in order to get bounds on the on the uh, on brains in monster square CFT, we put in the extra constraint that the bulk gap is equal to you know. Uh, oh, you put the yes, I see. So you don't. Like that's right. But the numerical bound we have uh, that does not include this bound, which you also have, that is kind of featureless. It just tells you there's a bound, but you don't see this. Uh, you don't see the saturations. I see. So you could, in principle, use some other method to say the gap, like you use modular construct to say the gap is this, and then use that. Yeah, we did that too. That's right. That's oh, right. you did do that. Yes, so, so we, we consider the, the most dumb thing you can do is to, to explore the bound as a function of C without putting in extra constraints, apart from the, we're focusing on stable brains, for example. Yeah, yeah. And you get some bound, but that's features. It tells you that such a bound exists, which I think is already surprising because, yeah, because for this, in this case, uh, nobody tells you that uh, there cannot be a non PPS brain of uh, G that's like a median at C equal to 100, right? Okay, and such a bound exists is already quite surprising. Uh, okay, that's it. It's, the bound is pretty featureless. But then you can you can put in additional constraints coming from modular bootstrap on the bulk operator spectrum. Okay, and this will produce a stronger bounds, and we have support of those. Yes. Those are the cases in which it's saturated. That's right. That's right. That's right. For example, I didn't say, but uh, this this uh, the, the places where this nice saturation exists are precisely these CFTs, which is a CFT that saturates the, the modular bootstrap bound for the box scalar gap. It has box scalar gap two, and the CFT that saturates the box scalar gap is under charge equal to eight in this case. And they're similar. The D line exceptional series all have the similar feature. Any more questions? If not, let's thank you, fun again. Great talk, lots of questions. Thank you. I think um, I overestimated.